Welcome to Public International Law. This is lesson number 21 on the creation and processes of treaty making. Remember, we address ourselves to the processes because there is no any outstanding procedure that has so far been adopted at the international level. In this case, it is better we recap on the meaning of the treaty before we get into its creation and uh, there too, the processes that are appropriate and required by law. The treaty means an international agreement concluded between states in written form and governed by international law remember, governed by international law, whether embodied in a single instrument or in two or more related instruments and whatever its particular designation. Point or section 16.2, who initiates the treaty creation. This is very significant. It is significant because number one, states can initiate the process under uh, the considerations of the United Nations Charter. And again, number two, we see that intergovernmental organizations, for instance, the United Nations can initiate a treaty process, such as we see in Vienna Convention initiated by the United Nations. Number three, even the international non-governmental organizations or the so-called international civil societies, for instance, the International Committee of the Red Cross that initiated the process of the four Vienna Conventions and their protocols in 1949, involving sovereign states in the entire process. It is very important here, after seeing the creation and who can create and who cannot create, the treaty is now clearer than before. Point number 16, point three, let's look at the processes or the stages that are very fundamental in the creation of the treaty. First, there is no any agreed procedure that one can look at, even in the Vienna Convention, on the law of treaties of 1969. Second, only the process matters in this area due to the complication sophistication that amounts to the nature of the treaty, characteristics of the treaty, but also the significance of the treaty as has been contemplated in the preamble of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties of 1969. Point number 16.3.1, let us look at the stages. First and foremost, we begin with the states because the states are the parties, not even the intergovernmental organizations, not the United Nations and not any, any other organization within the understanding of the international community. It must be, and it is exclusively the prerogative of the sovereign states. When we say prerogative of the sovereign states, we are talking about the governments, the executive arm of the government. The executive arm of the government works with the ministerial bodies, the ministerial uh, departments, and the concerned ministries are involved and engaged professionally 
technically, but also diplomatically with one another when they have to strike a deal on any project or program that may end up becoming an international treaty, whether bilateral or multilateral. Let us again uh, get to note down the concept of the engagement. It is engagement because there's a lot of exchange, a lot of communication, notifications, formal conversations that underpin the creation of the treaty. Remember when we talked about travel preparatoire, these are the tools that prepare the instrument beforehand. Number two, excuse me, number two under 16.3, the signing of the instruments, as we will see later, because by appending the signature, one is freely consenting to the instrument. And in that case, it must be done in good faith, but also strictly respecting the obligations generated by the rule of Pacta San Servanda. The number, point number three under section 16.3, the ratification. Ratification is a solemn process which is handled by individual states, by individual contracting parties to that particular treaty. 16.4, let us look at the state's diplomatic engagement. When we say diplomatic engagement, that means it is an engagement that is indeed very diplomatic, very professional. That means it includes and engages the professionals diplomats, bureaucrats, and technocrats. It must also be conversant of the international politics that may actually impact on the nature and the characteristics of that particular treaty. So it is the know-how or persons with that kind of knowledge, legal expertise, jurists, and uh, institutions that are engaged in the creation of the treaty. First, the exchange of documents. This can also be exchange of letters, which must come prior. And this is done among the perceived potential parties to this particular treaty, which has got object and purpose. Then number two, there must be communication in terms of official notifications and such notifications must be done in writing and also must be authentic. Number three, we get into diplomatic conferences, especially when it is a multilateral treaty. But when it is bilateral treaty, it can only engage the interested parties in an interstate meetings that may be several before the conclusion of the entire treaty. This is also done through the representation. Representation here, we mean that a person who is empowered by the state to give free consent on behalf of the state. And here we refer to Article 7 of the Convention to the Minister of Foreign Affairs or the Secretary of State, if it is the system such as the United States of America. In that case, that kind of official representative of the state bears a meaningful free consent that must demonstrate the full power of the state to participate in the creation of the treaty. The point A, we see those negotiations that portray the agreements and disagreements, the controversies, but also areas of convergence to make the entire document instrument agreeable, but also acceptable 
by the majority. Part B, we can look at, part B, we can look at the bureaucracies that are involved. I said already the bureaucrats, the technocrats, as well as the, the so-called people who are knowledgeable, the professionals that have got the technocracy, the know-how, the skills, but also the skills about the international law must be meaningfully involved in the creation process of the treaty. Point or section 16.5, the signing of the treaty, which of course is a legal practice in which the contracting parties show their position on the instrument by appending their signatures. And those signatures must be authentic and also must portray the consent which must be free Actually, no party is under obligation or under duress to sign a treaty. So it is a free concept that must be done in good faith, but in strict observation of Pacta San Servanda. But who has the power to sign or to express free consent in this manner, in good faith? in strict observation of Pacta San Servanda. This is the state party. It is the contracting party to the treaty. Back to the signatures. The signatures must be authentic. Number two, then there must be sharing of copies of the instrument among all the parties of which such parties must also give response and must show also their acceptance as well as their opposition to any area of the instrument. Part number three, the effect of the signature is just to show the free will or the free consent, but it is not the ratification. It doesn't mean that at this stage, the instrument is binding on the contracting parties. Section 16.6, we see the ratification process. This is the solemn practice that is done internally within the national jurisdiction. It is the parliament to bring the international instrument into ratification process. It is to legislate the already agreed on instrument through signatures, but to give it what we call the legislative power. That is, that particular state party is binding itself with the treaty, and it must go through such kind of formal processes which makes it law domestically, and it must be then entered into law by the executive that is the head of state and government or the head of government. It depends on the form of government the state is having. Let us look at uh, other areas under point uh, three here. The instrument must be assented. Number four, the parties or the parties ratifying the, the, the document must also send or deposit the copy that is ratified with the Secretariat of the United Nations. The Secretary General is the one accepting and receiving the deposit of the instrument officially, formally, and must be also expressed in uh, writing. Then number five deals with the uh, abstentions. There may be some abstentions. If the abstentions are more than those who are voting for the treaty, then that treaty can fall. The treaty stands 
when they garner the majority accepting the instrument, and in that case, ratifying the instrument. And in many different occasions, certain treaties do not see the light of the day because of failure to meet the thresholds within the understanding of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. But even though this is seen from a democratic perspective, that is the majority and the minority, those who are dissenting and those who are assenting, it is a question of giving authenticity and legality and legitimacy to the treaty beforehand. Let us look at the acceptance, number seven, the number eight that keeps our mind on the threshold. That threshold must be established and must be also embodied within the texture of the treaty or of the instrument before our discussion or in question. Let us move to point number nine. The languages that are used in the treaty are as follows. English, French, Russian, Chinese, and Spanish. These are the United Nations languages. Of course, if the treaty is to be written in another language, let us say in Arabic, there is no problem. As long as the entire document is translated into one of the United Nations official languages. I want to believe that the outcome of this lecture or of this lesson is very clearly spelled out on how the treaty is created and also which are the processes to be followed by the contracting parties in question. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here and thank you for checking out on these videos. This channel is meant to develop our strong and substantive knowledge on areas dealing with law and justice.